Well, greetings and welcome to week 15 of There's More to the Story. On Sunday, we talked about Esther, wonderful uh, story, talking about God's fingerprints all over the story, even though God is not specifically mentioned. <clears throat> Today and next Monday with There's More to the Story, I want to talk with you about Nehemiah, who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. Next week, next Sunday, we're going to talk about Ezra and the return of the people to Jerusalem. They returned in three waves from captivity. Ezra brought them back and they started rebuilding the temple in the second wave. Nehemiah brought them back in the third wave and they started rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. So Zerubbabel was the first wave. Ezra was the second wave, and Nehemiah was the third wave. Ezra Temple, Nehemiah the, Nehemiah the Walls of Jerusalem. Now, one of the interesting things is that Nehemiah appears in the Bible about halfway through the Bible, but actually the chronology of Nehemiah takes place in 444 B.C., right before the 400 silent years between 400 and the time Jesus was born. So even though Nehemiah appears about halfway, maybe two thirds of the way through the Old Testament, really he's one of the last books that was written chronologically. That's why it's been, I think, helpful to read through um, the story in a chronological way, because now we're getting toward week 15, week 16 with Ezra next Monday with Nehemiah and more lessons about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Um, because sometimes when you're reading the Bible, if you're reading it cover to cover, you get to Nehemiah and you think, well, how, how, is this, how does this fit? Going through the story like this helps see helps us see how it all fits together in the story. God's upper story and our lower story of rebellion. God's upper story, God's wanting to get us back. So um, about 70 years into exile, Babylonian captivity, deportation of the Jews, uh, exiles from Babylon started to return to Jerusalem. And as I said, Zerubbabel, I love that name, brought them back in the first wave, Ezra the second wave, where they started rebuilding the temple, the second temple of Jerusalem, if you remember that, from prior Bible studies or sermons, second temple. That's the one that Ezra rebuilt after the first one that Solomon built was destroyed. Um, uh, the nation of Judah was in a deep crisis, a religious crisis. As Ezra, we'll hear next week, started rebuilding the temple, they got distracted and they let it sit for 16 years. They, they came back, they were all excited, you'll hear about this next week, all excited about rebuilding the temple and then all of a sudden they lost interest in faith, in rebuilding and the temple lay in ruins and the indifference of the adults was passed on to their children because the children said, well, if mom and dad don't care, why should we care about rebuilding the temple? Even back then, if the faith is lost from one generation to the other, all is lost. We have to keep our faith passed on to the next generation. Um, sometimes even when we pass it on, our kids don't go to church or they lose interest or they go another way, but it's so critically important to pass the faith on. That's why we, we're trying to put an emphasis on, on children, young families. Uh, on the 19th, we have four kids getting First Communion. It's going to be a great time uh, for families and for the congregation on the 19th at 8.30. If you cannot all possibly be in church on the 19th at 8.30, be here because we've got four darling kids who are going to be taking their First Communion with chalices they made by themselves at a pottery place in Bend not in Bend, in Prineville. They'll be kneeling at the altar, the remade altar. For the, They'll be the first ones who kneel at the altar because the construction will be done by that time. 
So if at all possible, you can be here on the 18th, on the 19th of February at the 8.30 service. That would be great. So let me read from Nehemiah. First couple of verses are a little names that are a little hard to produce, so I'm going to pronounce, so I'm going to stumble over them. Nehemiah, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hekela, in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, one of my elders, Hanani, came with men from Judah, and I, this is Nehemiah writing, it's his journal, it's his diary. And I asked him about the Jews that survived, those who had escaped the captivity and about Jerusalem. Nehemiah is in captivity right now. They replied, the survivors there at the province who escaped captivity are in great trouble and shame. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Okay? Nehemiah writes, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and I mourned for days when he heard the words about the destruction of the walls of Jerusalem. And I wept and prayed and mourned for days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, he prays, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive to your, uh, and your eyes open, kind of like Hezekiah, remember that? to hear the words of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both I and my family have sinned. We have offended you deeply, failing to keep the commandments, the statutes and the ordinances that you commanded your, to your servant Moses. Remember the word that you have commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are under the farthest skies, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place at which I have chosen to establish my name, that is Jerusalem. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayers of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy at the sight of this man. He's going to go to the king. And then a little words, at that time I was a cupbearer to the king. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So here's Nehemiah. Where people come from Jerusalem. He says, hey dudes, how's it going? They say it's destroyed. The walls of Jerusalem are destroyed. This opening prayer of Nehemiah in chapter 1, in fact, if you can read through it in your leisure um, after this video, that would be great. There's five parts in there in Nehemiah's prayer. First of all, Nehemiah looks out with compassion. Okay, He has deep concern for his people. He's a man of clear priorities. He cares for the people back at Jerusalem. He was the cupbearer to the king. I'll talk about that again. But he knew that people were more important than things. People were more important than things. He's naturally concerned about the physical condition of the walls of Jerusalem but he's more concerned about the people and the future of the faith. Because if the walls of Jerusalem are torn down and can be overrun by adversaries, all is lost. So he looks out in compassion and he's driven to do something about it. Like us, with Turkey, like whatever that might be, with compassion with those around us, looking out with compassion. It was a calling from God that stirred deep within his heart. Think about how are you, what tugs on your heart with compassion? Nehemiah, Nehemiah's heart was tugged with compassion for the people of Jerusalem. What is it that, that grabs your heart that won't let you go with that sense of compassion? I sent out an email uh, a day or two ago about Lutheran disaster response, about the, 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 the whole earthquake in Turkey and Syria. 
Um, they're on the ground, boots on the ground, giving aid there, a reputable organization working with reputable organizations there. If that tugs on your heart, check out that, that uh, email and consider contributing to that. Earthquake response, Turkey, if you write that in the memo line of your check. Whether it's a Hungary, whether it's Oasis Village that we support here at church, what tugs at your heart? Second, Nehemiah looked up in dependence, in dependence on God. He prayed fervently. His reaction, when he looks out with compassion, his reaction is to look up in dependence, in, in dependence on God. He goes before God with an earnest and natural and spontaneous prayer. He sat down and he wept for days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And he called on God to keep God's promises to God's people. He looked up in dependence. He also looked inward in penitence. Think of that. He makes sure that he has a reality check saying, you know, we've sinned, we've screwed up, we've messed up. We haven't been the people that you wish we would be. We have all gone astray. In intensity and honesty, he says, you know, I'm sorry, God, I messed up. He looked out in compassion, up in dependence, inward, in penitence. All these things are good steps for us. We're a people who have sinned by nature by what we've done and by what we've left undone. And that introspection and that penitence is an important part of the progression of prayer. Nehemiah also looked back in gratitude. He says, you know, you've been faithful through Moses that you'll bless those who keep your commandments and statutes. So he looks back in gratitude saying, thank you, God, for being gracious with us. Sin must be confessed in penitence, but it doesn't have to be wallowed in. You don't have to sit in your sin all day long. Nehemiah reflects on God's grace, grace and God's unmerited love. He says, God, even though they've sinned, these are your people in Jerusalem. These are your servants. Nehemiah says, God, you have redeemed them. So gratitude for what God has done with the, in the past is an important part of living in penitence, but moving past it in gratitude, knowing that God is a God from whom all blessings flow. And then finally, Nehemiah looks forward in confidence. After, after confessing, after remembering the gratitude, he looks forward in confidence, in confidence, praying for God to do something with full confidence that God's will will be done. Um, encouraged by God's mercies, he's encouraged by God's future grace. And at that time, I was a cupbearer for the king. Do you know what a cupbearer is? It is a pretty good job. A cupbearer for the king was to taste the food and the wine that was brought that the king was going to eat to make sure it wasn't poisoned. Back in those days, people were trying to poison a king all the time. Easier than waging a big battle, you poison the enemy king. So they have cupbearers who would taste the king's food, and if they didn't die, the king would eat it. A little bit of a dangerous job, but... Um, you know, if somebody wants to put cyanide in the king's uh, hamburger or in his uh, grapefruit juice, the cupbearer eats it, drinks it. If he doesn't die, then the king gets it. So it was a good job, but it was pretty precarious. And what Nehemiah did is he prayed. He prayed. He was a cupbearer for the king. On um, next week and next Monday, we'll hear how he goes to the king, and the king actually provides the supplies for the walls of Jerusalem to be rebuilt. It's an amazing turn of events. We'll hear about that more. The God of grace and glory leading Nehemiah, leading us.
into a faithful following of God incarnate in Jesus. So enjoy your reading today for um, uh, the, the next week. We'll talk about Ezra, we'll talk about Nehemiah, and then we'll take a break for Lent. So good to be with you until I see you again. You take care. Bye-bye.